overview of what's actually happening in Australia because there's so much cool stuff going on. We had um, an unconvention here in WA on um, Saturday last week with 25 organizations, and it's 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 really cool to see how you know whether you put them all in in one room, how much stuff actually is going on, even if it's not mainstream yet. There it is sort of bubbling behind the scenes, and I think uh, you, Anthony, you're um, doing that with your. I mean, that's one of the purposes of your podcast, I guess, to to highlight or shine a light on all these uh, people who are actually doing things in the regenerative movement and the new economy movement. So we're going to kick in here and I'll let people in because uh, normally people join uh, during the talk. And then if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and we'll do that after Anthony's presentation. Welcome, Anthony. All right. Thanks, Adam. G'day, everyone. Yeah, right on, Adam, in terms of your your intro there it's precisely what i'm doing the podcast and yeah really most else of what i do as well it sort of happened by accident but that's another story but but yeah it's really become compelling for that reason and you know i wish i was there that day too while we we're on it but um and, and i wish i was at a lot of other things this year too but a busy year sort of paradoxically perhaps for most but but not in this company i dare say uh, it's been a very busy year and it was compounded by illness with my dad. So I, I haven't got out much to tell you the truth aside from the podcast itself. Uh, but that's continued to take me to good places and inspiring places. And we'll deal with a bit of that here, of course. I'll start by acknowledging country, hey, the, the Wajok Noongar people, country we're presenting on. Uh, I see you there, Dylan. So I, I assume you're at home on the same country. I don't know Angela or Charity, so it's terrific to be with you today and um i wonder if you're local too in fact why don't you um chime in on the chat i actually would love to just so i know a bit about dylan but i don't know you charity or angela and for if there were more people here i didn't know i was particularly going to ask this but let's do it anyway um to just have it, put a little bit of text in the chat area as to where you are and and just a couple of words about what lights you up, given that we're right on topic in terms of the great stuff that's been happening in the world. Oh, beautiful country. Yeah, wow. Well, ha ha. <laughs> you're, a, you're a very kind man, Dylan. <laughs> but yeah, right on, me too. And Frio, of course, Adam, yeah. Let's see, is there anything else in there? No, Angela might be getting a cup of tea. It's also cool to be here in the sense that I was at the first Nina conference before it was Nina back in 2016 in sydney so it's it's very cool to see a where it's come and going and then to be part of it here today i've got another question for you i mean again i know this of dylan i actually don't know this of adam but i'm sort of he's probably chimed in occasionally who listens to the regeneration podcast excellent that's great thanks charity and i see um andrew Sada, mr bubbles is or dr bubbles is here sort of sort of <laughs> there he is G'day. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear us yet. Yeah, great. So I don't really need to sort of say much more about the rationale for it, but it's really grown its it's really grown its own legs on the back of I mean, I can't possibly get to all the stories. So whenever I hear another podcast come up or indeed these sorts of sessions, I'm like, yeah, great. Because we need we just need more of it. It's all out there, it's all happening, but of course it's not carrying the day yet. This podcast has become a, a beautiful intensive workshop for me and, and a great way of sharing stories. Now Kate asked if I'd talk a bit about the, the regen farming thing. It's become a bit of a theme of late and, and learning from First Nations particularly. Um, what you'll find as I go and it won't surprise you at all is that really uh, it's what's underneath that that's most interesting. The thinking the systemic approach, holistic approach. Um, so if you do want more detail that I'm going to give you in an initial spiel on any particular aspect, because they're all it's all fascinating at detail, but I won't go into too much detail here. I'll stay at that broader level largely. And um, but we can go into whatever sort of you want to delve into most in the QA from there. Now I'm wondering if did any of you see just a a, a wave of hands, so, well, most of you are on video. For those who aren't, you could give us a little I think there's a tick function, isn't there? or there's a yes, no tick cross function, isn't there? Who saw the dialogue with Tyson Yunker Porter and David Suzuki recently? It was a, uh, one of the Beyond Crisis 
nobody okay if you get a chance it's probably worth it uh, so it was a, related to the nina stuff um i think they're calling it beyond crisis though the series that they're doing and and Tyson was with David Suzuki and someone else. But what I remember most is their exchange because David Suzuki was profoundly moving in his literally quote unquote, it's too late, I've given up. And Tyson actually quipped, wow, the world's greatest optimist is saying it's all over. This is serious. And in all, in all seriousness, it sort of felt like it was. But through the conversation, I felt like the nuance of that position came out because he hasn't stopped doing what he's doing. In fact, he continues to learn in ways that I found profound listening to him. And to be honest, I haven't always paid close attention. I don't know of his work, obviously, but I haven't been a close follower of it. I've sort of looked elsewhere mostly, but I found this incredibly moving and insightful and I feel like it's a bit of a theme and I wanted to start with this to ground us in the fact that you, what you're going to hear from me is some amazing stuff but you're not going to hear a gilding the lily really my first podcast guest John Fullerton said way back so three years ago he used to have a metaphor I don't know if he still runs with it I'd be really curious actually he said so what we're trying to do it's an enormous challenge the transitions we're trying to make we're really trying to change the engines out in the plane while we're in flight and not crash. I feel like the chances of that now are pretty shot. The plane's coming down of the current system and it's probably not going to transition in any smooth manner. We've sort of had our chances to do that. So I wanted to ground it in that sort of, I, I sort of, I'm in that camp. I believe that to be true. We're in a pretty diabolical moment. The momentum of the juggernaut is still strong even with renewables you see the the rush to renewables and even regen egg for that matter it's not a, it's not holistic by and large it's a powerful powerful incumbent we know this but that's not necessarily the worst news you're going to hear i mean the worst news will be if it wipes out all you know rebirth i don't believe that to be true so let's go into that. Eh? I wanted to just share a bit more about me in terms of where my gratitude lies to, to elders, speaking of which, and, um, and in a couple of ways. So I met a bloke called Frank Fisher in the year 2000 in Melbourne. And Frank was a legend, is a legend in Victoria and mostly Melbourne. He couldn't get much beyond that because he had chronic illness for 40 years. He was supposed to be dead at age 40. He lived to 70 blissfully for me because I, I ended up teaching with him too but when I first met him I studied with him and he was one of the guys who introduced the systems thinking sort of movement and theory to Australia and particularly into education into tertiary education postgrad at that and so I I and again accidentally as most things are I found um, I, I found myself in that it's another story for another day and it was a catalytic moment. It, it didn't give me, it didn't bring this stuff to me so much as show me that there was a, a coherent body of knowledge and work around the whole system's holistic focus. And that, and that he taught me then how I could weave the thread of understanding through society and a lot of the world, although really the punchline was that the broader world's beyond us, but that's the great punchline. The great mystery will always remain beyond it. So it's, a, it's an extremely humbling tool as well as an extremely empowering tool. So it was a huge moment for me. And with that, I went from being a pretty angry young guy who'd essentially shut off society and was going playing my music and touring, you know, touring the world and all the infrastructure that the world set up, that society set up, you know, it was that classic but disassociating from it and feeling like it was just there wasn't much to to be inspired by it so he reconnected me with communities and societies and and really by extension compassion and wisdom how to do that so that was back then and that's been my in then to what i now cover in the podcast with the whole systems and stories focus so the regenerative focus is really on people that are helping bring the living systems that we are part of 
back to life. And with that came a sense of responsibility because if I'm part of it, then I'm responsible for it. What I used to just dismiss and sort of uh, diss, I'm part of the cause, whether I like it or not. And not just historically, you're in it. But his anthology was called Responsibility, two words. And and that's the other responsible that that it equipped me with more. So I'm still on the learning journey uh, as evidenced in the podcast. So I'm going to flip up a couple of Quick, not, I haven't got many slides, but I'm going to flip up a couple of slides because, just to illustrate the point. And again, I'm taking a deviation from regen farming and First Nations thinking just to, again, come back around and highlight the holistic nature of it all. This is something Frank presented to me way back then, which was literally the last straw before I sold my car. And I, I didn't own one again until the podcast was starting to take me to the regions, actually. He used to call them curb decoration. And with this rationale, so most people actually don't, can't even answer the question. I've asked it for 20 years. How efficient is a car? We just don't even know. Such is our energy illiteracy. And how can we pretend to be supplanting or replacing energy sources to renewable when we don't even know how energy works? Uh, not that we all need to be engineers, but you know, I'm not an engineer, but this level of understanding sort of a minimum. Already, most of the energy that will get, try to you know, go to fuel to motion goes into heat and that's before you talk about tailpipe emissions and so forth but given the car weighs let's just say for ease of mathematics this little 80 kilo body or whatever in my case that might jump in a car so this massive ton or two these days of material so really broadly we can say and he used to say it's about one percent efficient then factor in the rest all the other costs that we're probably well familiar with that then you have to work to pay for so factor in that time into your travel time and then factor in the rest across the board, you know, from your immediate infrastructure and policing and so forth. And you just watch the layers and layers that we, that we then put on top of it um, to try and make the bloody thing work <laughs> while we keep adding completely inefficient ways of getting around to the system. So vastly less than 1% efficient. Those light bulbs that we phased out so quickly uh, they were 3% efficient, you know, a, a horror show, really. So rightly, we phased them out super quick. This is vastly worse. I actually didn't want to go on just yet. I just want to, whenever I present on transport, I'll, oft, I'll often try to boil it down to as an apples v apples comparison because in your day-to-day -day life, when it takes you 15 minutes to drive somewhere and maybe 30, maybe 40 in public transport and, and using active transport as well, bike and walking or whatever, then people say, oh, I just can't do it. And if you're going to extrapolate the realities I've shown here, you're at least, what I say is, you're at least doubling your immediate travel time in the car to get an apples v apples comparison, at least. So you'd at least be saying effectively, my travel time is half an hour in the car. You're probably tripling it though. So effectively your travel time is 45 minutes in the car. So you're already slower than I find often on a bike alone, but certainly with rail sometimes or other, other travel mechanisms into it, even a share car for that matter, just not owning your own and everybody owning their own. And at times I would say you're quadrupling it. So at least doubling, probably tripling, often quadrupling your direct A to B travel time to get your more effective actual time consumed in that, in having your uh, private car to to do that a to b transaction because you've only just started when you get to your destination then you have to go and work it up to pay for all the other things and of course we struggle to pay for the bigger picture obesity epidemics and climate and so forth this is the other story of course but i'm going to demonstrate a similar thing and actually let me say one more thing about where we've just come from first so while efficiency I've just basically hammered home why efficiency is so important. But really the punchline around that car example is that the goal is most important because what we're effectively doing when we drive our cars around is driving our cars around. We're not taking ourselves, transporting ourselves A to B, we're transporting two tonne of material A to B. So the goal of the exercise has to be considered before all well-meaning you know, R&D or whatever, tries to eke out another percentage point of efficiency or another percentage decimal point of efficiency, but it's the wrong system. 
in systems thinking, we often say, don't do the wrong thing right. Get the system right. And, and of course, Donella Meadows' hierarchy of one to 12 leverage points in a system will have the goal, I can't remember, something about third, there's higher, and we're gonna go higher in this talk, but um, the goal's fundamental. Where are we going? And of course that applies with the goal in terms of the car, sorry, being how you move yourself from A to B. Okay, that's a different story transport services come into being not, not default mechanisms like that are so inefficient like the car and of course a lot more active transport i'm going to leave that detail for now and then extrapolate to the economy you set up the goal first so donut economics is one example uh, certainly obviously away from gdp donut economics is a great example but there are there are myriad others that can be figured out relative to local domains of how we set a goal how we decide what's important to us and then and then try and hit it. Now it's the same here with, with farming and agriculture. And I guess I've increasingly, increasingly gravitated to it. I don't know if I have. I mean, some people say to me, gee, so you've ended up being big on food. I'm like, no, it's the same focus. <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to stitch it all together. I'm trying to help stitch it all together, learn how to stitch it all together. So we end up with a society that works. What I've learned though, <clears throat> pardon me, that I hadn't realized so much before or thought about so much before, it sounds obvious though when you say it, it doesn't so much, that agriculture and food is the basis of civilization. Alan Savory said to me the other day, you can't have sustainable business. You can't have sustainable anything unless or until agriculture is truly regenerative. Because he said, and he's, it's, it's really nicely put, so many civilizations have passed before us and agriculture continued. We we are often, and I've lived amongst the Mayan mostly in, of, of indigenous populations or post-civilization populations in Guatemala and Central America. And it's true, they're, they're still there. And agriculture's there, but cities aren't, they're in ruins. So there's our challenge. This I ripped off from Charlie Massey's presentation last year, hence the dates, but they've just, they've kept coming, these dust storms. And that, that is it. That's your civilization right there. That is topsoil. That's our food supply. It's not just a inconvenience on the day this is what it looked like for us passing through one interestingly soon after we left charlie's farm not well not far out of canberra and and this was big because charlie's farm still had cover on it but there was dust fields everywhere else and this will give you if you haven't been in one a sense of what it's like we, we just had to pull up couldn't see where we were going <clears throat> oh, hang on why isn't it letting me here we go i don't know if the volume will come through but that's not so important if it doesn't if the visuals are, will show you everything you need to know. It was all exciting for the young fella, but uh, diabolical for us. And yeah, you can see there, there was just a little bit of sleet. So it's just mud being slung at the windows. Now that used to happen here. This is the Kimberley and a particular pastoral station <clears throat> in the Kimberley. It also used to happen at Woolene Station in the Murchison. Uh, that, uh, David Pollock, who's there now, remembers them well, even just 10 years ago. Uh, they don't happen now. That gives you an indication. And I feel like an extraordinary indication that what are becoming productive landscapes, again, have been regenerated on the back of being cattle country. Now, Woolene will tell one story about that, that it's taken stock off to have some recovery. Kachana will tell another story that it's taken, actually repopulating because it had been abandoned for a long time to come back on with stock to regenerate it. So there's a whole school of thought there, but very holistic thinking in their application of what's appropriate in a given time, in a given place. If you know the Woolene Station story, the dingoes have been key, letting the apex predator back into the system. So either way, you're restoring systems because in the Katana case, they view having the cattle on there and even the wild donkeys as being the megafauna that we used to have in this country that we need. The alternative is to keep burning it all when it grows out, which dehydrates country particularly with the industrially intensive version of fire that we still use that I see First Nations people despairing at 
around the country. Oh, by the way, that water you can just drink out of now um, and that runs year, year round and clear. It, it had stopped running completely. This gives you an idea. I mean, that's some of the detail that we're seeing in a lot of cases, but it's estimated still by the people in it that only 10% of farmers and pastoralists are onto this. So it's still far from mainstream. Charlie will often talk about this, and perhaps some of you have heard it, out of the drawdown work, that if you combine the sort of region ag related items, it's, it's a whopping 240% greater than the next, well, than the listed number one item. There are other powerful aggregations too, but that's, that's a big one. And it emphasizes the point. So it gives you a few visuals on what I'll, I'll come to a, a close with, and then we can, we can have a chat. I find out of it, what, out of all these farmers and pastoralists taking holistic approaches, there is an extraordinary, and those of you who have listened to recent podcasts will be on this journey with me. So but it's an, I find an extraordinary convergence of language and insight and meaning and outcomes. And it's been exhibited by people like the Haggertys in the Wheat Belt, Terry McCoster in Queensland, Charlie Massey certainly, uh, Nicole Masters in Montana in the States, and Alan Savory for that matter. And it's something that Tyson Yunker Porter, who wrote Sand Talk, talked strongly about as well. Noel Nan up here in, in Wajat Noongar country. Even, even, why should it be even? But even Amy and Lily, a couple of international athletes, champion athletes that I had on recently, talking the same language. So this is super interesting to me. And it's basically one way to think about it is to think about how we have outsourced our humanity, not just made a planet unsustainable or a civilization unsustainable with the tech, with the technology, the fix focus, the reductionist focus. And I loved the way Tyson talked about this with a, with a, he cited a piece of footage that he'd seen of Andaman Islanders and he's never been able to find it since, but he saw this footage and they and male and female, um, upon arrival of colonists with film going, obviously. And, and he said they're, they're in, they, they were just so alive. Their eyes burned with a ferocity and an intellect. And, and they were both as muscled as each other, man and woman together. And it's been a sort of a guiding image for him. He thinks about it every day, he said, which is why I had to ask him about it in the podcast. And funnily enough, and this is sort of the, the maelstrom I feel like I'm caught up with in a way, in my parallel journey to these people who are experiencing the same thing in their own realms. Then I speak to Nicole Masters and I read her book. And why would a, a book called For the Love of Soil have a tale about Andaman Islanders in it as well? And she was referring to the tsunami in 2004, uh, where it obviously caused untold damage through that region. And people thought, geez, well, what would happen to those ocean people that, you know, out on the islands? Uh, they must be stuffed. They must have been wiped out. And they weren't, they were scarcely harmed because they sensed it. They, like even we noticed birds would do when there's a storm coming and they go to higher ground or, or, or out to sea. This is what these people did. They didn't have the electronic radars and so on that we've invested in since. They just sensed it coming. They knew how to read the country. Noel Nanup obviously would talk in similar themes. But those athletes are talking in similar themes. The Haggerty's in the Wheat Belt, they'll say not only that, not only are they being led by that sort of acute re-embodying of ourselves as, in Tyson's words, superhuman, but really it's just human, super to relative to what we've lost, you know, who we've become today. But they then observe the intelligence in the sheep that for them are central to rehabilitating landscapes in the Wheat Belt in the salt sand ridden wheat belt. The sheep they've learned are showing them where they need to be. And one day they start drinking from a salt lake and they're like, what are they doing? It had become fresh water on top. And they would never have known, they would never even thought about checking that is there fresh water coming up on that salt lake now? Extraordinary stories. And they call their system natural intelligence as a retort to artificial intelligence, that actually, and back in Tyson's words, the superhumanness we seek through our technology is actually already in us if we would reclaim it and go there again. And then you have people like Zach Bush talking, the physician from the States talking about the microbiome and others now in greater depth 
are helping us understand the, the, again, the connections, you know, Tyson talks about gut as the center of their intelligence, the spirit. And, and here we are learning that gut is almost the, perhaps even the primary brain in humans through the microbiome and our connections with soil and land and so, and everything else. And even within that, that viruses in the microbiome are actually the most helpful aspects in soil, for example. So what does that tell us about how we're trying to grapple with this virus? I find just to close then, there's, a, there's an enormous metaphor in this. You know, a lot of the thinking back in the 90s and 2000s around the internet and so forth was that we would develop a global consciousness finally. I feel like this is that global consciousness. And, and the best of those developers of the net, we're trying to sort of do it that way. But that is our task today. Zach Bush said, it's the first one I noticed who said, we need to organise like the microbiome, organise societies like the microbiome. I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And then Nicole Masters starts talking about the regenerative agriculture movement as mycelial network, you know, under the radar and just spreading and connecting. That might be what we would consider the real global economy not the speculative global casino or the extractive sort of detached mega structures that we have now. Connection again, genuine prosperity. There's a terrific book out right now called Collective Courage about the uh, African-American history of economies, of collaborative economies. But really, it's, it's still at the base of everything that actually works in our society right now. That you have competition on top as a layer on top, sure. Like our footy leagues, they're a layer of competition on top, but they're not a competitive league. Everything else about the league and the way the TV ties in and everything else is, is cooperative. And we just do it all together. And we don't even notice it. We do it all together so well. Then we just come together for the games and notice the competition. All things that work well for us seem to work a bit like that. So who knows what happens from here? What's possible or how fast? Um, sort of paradoxically, Nora Bateson would say, Alan Savory would say, my old mentor Frank Fisher would say, he used to have a saying, save the wilderness within. That humanity, the rest will take care of itself. And then Nora, I noticed recently, she, she used the word wild when, when talking about reinvigorating ourselves as humans alive in the world. And I, of course, then had an affinity with that. And, and Alan Savory talks about holistic context. It's, it's talking about conditions from which the better prospects can emerge and prosperity can emerge. So in that sense, when I say it's about the goal, it's sort of about the goal and it's sort of not. Uh, again, in Nora's words, she said, it's showing up, but standing back at the same time. It's all of that. It's a, it's a beautiful dance. And, and they're the upper realms, the higher one and two of Donella Meadows leverage points, talking about the way of thinking and the paradigm. That's, that's the ultimate place. And that is where we come alive. So I'll leave it there and uh, we can go into a chat. You can lead us wherever you like from there. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Anthony, awesome. Uh, yeah, should we uh, jump into Q&A? Put, put questions in the chat if you have any, but um, let's start. Uh, so you're all muted, so you know, by default. So if you wanna unmute yourself and ask Anthony a question or have any comments to what he said. I see Kit in the, in the chat. G'day, Kit, I can't see on the screen. Oh, there you are, you're the flower, nice. <laughs> flower with the heart, beautiful. Oh, Angela, you're in Eltham, brilliant. Yeah, I used to live in Eltham briefly. I'm getting more passionate about region farming too. Yeah, g'day, there you are. Hey, Anthony, um, can I ask a question? Yeah, mate, hello. Hey, Don, good to see good. you. You too. Um, so I think about the, all the players in the space and how they can, like what are the meta structures to support them to work collaboratively rather than competitively hmm. in, in terms of the new economy um, network, yeah. if you like. So yeah. what's the, what kind of meta, meta structures might support the economy at yeah I, I love that analogy of the the you know the football league it's brilliant absolutely brilliant um so what would that look like for um all the different players in in this kind of space um and i i ask you first just because you're a hub you know as a host you're, you're a host of these 
um, people and you're a host of the whole community. So I think you're a wonderful person to ask for your perspective on this. Thanks, mate. And um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I actually just, what you just said lands very deeply with me, mate, just to note not let that pass uh, to the extent that I am. <laughs> it's very humbling. Yeah, so a couple of things to say on it. It's a really good question because, I mean, I guess for a whole bunch of obvious reasons, but also perhaps some less obvious ones. Because again, I think so much of what's happening in nominally, well, I say this in a positive way, in as we go about the transition, as big money starts to swing in to certainly region ag, renewables and so forth, there's opportunity to engage then across communities in ways that we haven't done before, which is very cool. And I just literally just had a chat with some Trillion Trees folk here in Perth because they had a donor come out of nowhere, a big corporate body saying, we want to donate to, you know, for you to plant trees. I'm like, geez, how do we stare down this money? Like, what do we do? And they actually said, they said no. But, but then, oh, and, and uh, I don't think she'd mind me saying, Kaz, Carol Winfield, she was at the Nora Bates and stuff too that we met at, Andrew. Um, she said, this is what I've drafted to say no. What do you think? And it was, a, you know, good enough. Thanks, but no thanks. But I actually thought, you know what? Why don't you get together? Like, if you can, you know, this is the thing. So this is not for profits, resource, hamstrung, and how does it go about this engagement? It's not in its you know, budget. But I said, is it in your mission? She said, Absolutely, it's in our mission. And and so if you can find the means to engage in a process of being with these people and developing the understanding that we need of what the transitions really look like, it's not just shifting energy source, not just shifting in, you know, investment to another realm where you get the same returns, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, there's a holistic approach here. And I say this first, Andrew, and density question, it might feel like a tangent, but the Haggerty's, for example, in the wheat belt are also, they've turned down millions, but they're currently working with some investors at scale in such a process. And that's what I said to Kaz, said, I'm seeing it actually potentially nominally working. And, and, and why wouldn't it if you're genuine? So that does emphasize, I think, the value of, of your question that we, we need these meta structures as much to support each other but, and continue to learn, but, but really with an expanded understanding of what that means with other people that we've never been with. Tyson even says the same thing, uh, s- stick to the people you, you haven't before or something, something along those lines. It's a consistent theme again through all the people I admire most. So, you know, when I say, when I say that then, I feel like the Haggerty's, for example, are setting up a meta structure and they're just doing it but they're doing it for the benefit of everybody that it can become, if they can establish a model and a path that's shown success in that way with these investors, then there's a, well, there's not only one example of money coming in that's being harnessed properly, but there's a model and they will share it openly. And, and so you, you have the development of a meta structure that doesn't have a name and, and maybe it never will, maybe it doesn't need to, but there's one example, certainly obviously this, is another Regen WA in the Regen Ag space. In, it's, it's the first of its kind in Australia. It's a peer-to-peer producer network, nothing to sell. That's bloody rare. <laughs> to, 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 if you're looking for help, to find a place you can go for help where people aren't trying to sell something to you, massive, massive. So that's been set up and it's only a year or so old already. That's, that sort of thing again, perhaps as uh, probably just emphasizes the value of this network too, but in whatever your space. And I think all the more, if it can cross over to where it's less expected, more surprising, you know, it's the in-between bits, which many of us will be accustomed to in systems thinking as well. If we can get in between the Ninas and the Regen WA, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. And it's bloody fun. Like it's bloody enlivening. And, and then just to close, for whatever offerings you know i've got in answer hunter lovins when i chatted with her for the podcast she was pivotal in the development of the well-being economy alliance and the regenerative communities network like pretty much everything you know, she's been pivotal in and she was doing that because she's thinking can we stop competing for money and share and da 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 and and get a movement that carries the day 
But still, even then, you know, and I said to her something like, oh, so, so Wellbeing Economy Alliance was supposed to be it. And then came Regenerative Communities Network. So, and then, you know, something else is coming still. And she's like, yeah, I know. We're just doing the same thing again. And she was sort of despairing. But then we were like, well, maybe that's the way it, these meta structures need to be. Yeah. So there's a thought. Maybe, maybe they don't all have to have a label. Mm. And, and I guess that's the microbiome, isn't it? It's, and the viruses, if we go with that metaphor, it's ever morphing and changing and just follow it, connect and fertilize and get in between and see what, essentially see what happens. Yeah. But amazing things are happening. There's enough to go on to, to think, okay, that could work in terms of the way you, we prefer to be living. Great. There was um, there's a um, question from Kit in the chat. Do you want to unmute Kit and ask the question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, when when Anthony was sharing there um, about the um, donor, I, I heard him it came through as donut, and then it made me think about donut economics in the re, in like regenerative agriculture and like holistic ag agriculture and how donut economics could work in that space. I'm curious if that if you're aware of that happening in that space. I've got a friend who was a farmer for over 30 years and he's he's been teaching me a lot about farming, but how like it's all about efficiency. So they would buy lots of land to then have a better price at what they would be selling. But then, you know, it would it would um, discredit a lot of smaller farmers that couldn't afford bigger blocks. So, yeah, I just see lots of, how to say it, the, 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 mon the monopolizing that's happening in farming, but then the mixture of prices across many, like today being mm. Monday, the, you know, the fuel, fuel prices change every day, but the same like in, I think with markets with wheat and all the different farming things that are sold. So I think it's, it's, a, big, it's a big topic. Oh, it's massive. No, you're absolutely right. And, and that's what the Haggerty's, for example, and again, they're not alone, I'm just, well, we're on them and they're local to us. They're, that's why they're putting so much effort into what they're doing because they, basically they say, until we get the pull through, because right now all their grains, extraordinary grains free of all chemical residue and, and from regener you know, getting seeded into sand and in one year producing with, with the way they're doing it. Uh, and I'm not joking, like literally sand, there, there's footage their son put on TikTok which was sent to me because I'm not on TikTok, but I saw it, it was extraordinary, is that they believe that that will be the thing and that will get their grains out of the, just the general lot into a premium category where they get their returns and that the, then will open up the possibilities for everybody else. So it's connecting it through to the consumer, I don't even, I hate that word so much, to the eater end that will be pivotal, they, they say, and many others say, in helping others who are definitely looking over the fence everywhere because it's working, right? And they're stressed. Oh, there was another suicide of a 40-year-old mum in the wheat belt. No one hears about that. That was last week. No one hears about that. It's still all out there in Australia right now. So much stress and despair with farmers seeing the land go the way it's going and just no support. And, of course, the, the, the populations have been drained, so there's, they're, they're more lonely out there, et cetera. So there is another story going on and they feel like if you can close the loop, if you like, that it will um, potentially change the day really quickly. Now, does that relate to donut economics? I mean, I think it does. In as much if you take that goal level, you're talking about that they're not interested in output. You know, and Zach Bush will talk about this too. It's a whole other conversation. He jokes that the conversation at the pub will or is going from uh, how many ton did you put in the silo today sort of thing to what new bird species did you see this week? You know, that qualitative shift. And, you know, as much when Diane Ian will tell me they don't stress and I almost choke on my drink, you know, how, how can you be saying that when I know they're suiciding up the road? You know, and I say that with deep, deep respect and, and gravity. This, that story's really stayed with me. Clearly, I'm, I'm still trying to think about what, my responsibility is with those stories. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's a space that I'm in with that farmer friend. He he ended really? up like navigating suicide and mm. 
um, lost his farm and he yep. does a lot of awareness raising to do with suicide and farming, but he's, he's also, he's a trained financial counselor and he understands the complexities um, around finance. But it, it's is it because the system is set up that way. Yes. It's so hard. Dead right. Yep. It's just, so, it's so, yeah. Yep. Well, that's the other aspect of the answer then, Kit, really. Um, and, and that's for everyone. And it's for cities most because uh, we're served by these people. Um, if they're not out there producing food, you know, good luck, cities. Donut economics is, is and, you know, donut economics is taking hold in some cities. So that's really interesting. But there's another farmer who was just on ABC's Conversations, Rob Pekin, and he's been on the podcast, who was in this position as well. Dairy farm went bankrupt. He was nearly driven to suicide. Now he, he has set up with others in Brisbane, Food Connect, and perhaps some of you know, if you don't, you, you can look it up there. And there are episode 28, I think, on the podcast. Extraordinary story for so many reasons. And it's, basically, it's community-supported agriculture at heart, but it's connection. It's connection, it's relationship, it's meaning, it's, it's shared risk, it's understanding where your food comes from, it's all that. It changes the system. And, and then they went and crowdfunded equity to the tune of two and a half million or something and, and set up a whole bunch of other enterprises in a, in a big shed in Brizzy that they were operating out of that they previously were renting. So, I mean, that's, that's system changing stuff. You know, you used the word efficiency kit earlier. Per my car example, yeah, efficiency is vital and important, it's, but it's not it. It's not enough. You can be doing the wrong thing in a better way. Um, and that's what we're seeing a lot of in farming, obviously. And, and finance, though, I mean, if we're talking holistic, finance is absolutely part of it. It's just not. And, and you know, output is part of it, but they're just not the name of the game. Uh, and that comes back to the donut model as much, but others too. But I, I do like the donut one as well. Just getting the goal right. And, and I guess the donut's good too, because it, it sets up a visual understanding that there are multiple goals at once. So again, really you go a bit higher as to how you're thinking about the whole. Yeah. But thanks Kit, it's a vital part of it. The false efficiency charity, exactly, exactly. Yeah, where are we going <laughs> is the first question. And then how are we doing it? There was another question from uh, Andrew here. Do you want to unmute, Andrew? Yeah, okay, so this one is, an, a, I think, another good one to ask you, Anthony. So it's about <clears throat> what do you think is required for uh, farmers who haven't really heard and understood, heard of regenerative agriculture or understood it yet, like what's required in order for them to A, hear about it and B, understand what it is? You know, how do you make it as simple as, as simple a message as possible to hook their attention? And, you know, mm. how do you speak to them in the language that they understand so they're able to go, huh, mm. uh, you know, and become curious and interested? Yeah, yeah. In a sense, there's whatever it'll be, a four or five word answer. They have to hear it from other farmers. Cool. And that, seem, that seems to be the overwhelming, like there's more to be said. Obviously that's a, that's a massive question and everybody's really looking at it and have been for decades. Uh, and, and certainly I'm learning about how they've been looking at it and exploring it. But, but it, yeah, it's peer to peer. That's where the trust is, especially now where it's been lost in so many other places. The trust is in the people you know that you trust rather than the meta entities. Yeah, the big institutions. But you know, Ellen Saber will say at the same time, they're still important. We still need, if we want this stuff to go to scale, it's not that you want to throw out your institutions, you just got to change them. So, you know, your question is a big one. It's, a, it's, it's the crux of everything. There's so much looking into it. There's so much we could say about it, but certainly I think in a meta theme, if you like, across the board, and it's certainly with farmers, is that if they see and hear from each other about it, um, and, and that's why you're getting networks like Region WA, where people can go when they're in that position and know that they're not gonna be sold to. They can go and just trust what other people will tell them about their experience and the opportunities and what to look out for and da da da. So, but, and that's the same here, you know, um, places where you can go and trust 
in the sharing will then because you know how many i don't know if you've seen this but i've how many have i even seen in just a few years over the fence shots right complete i mean that dust storm and i've just left massey's place with with grass on it but the difference isn't so much in the land it's in the mind of the farmer that's right that that either can't see it at all but i think that's decreasingly the case i think increasingly they see it most of what i hear now from farmers who aren't changing is that they don't like what they're doing pouring all the chemicals and stuff that's pretty Mm. i'm hearing that a lot it we don't want to be doing it but so then it's 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 sort of a two-pronged thing on a functional level it's opportunity to know that you're not going to fall in a heap so the haggerty's thing of let's show that it can connect through to premiums and stuff so people will will, will then be convinced i'm going to stay alive this will be viable at a deeper level it's the lock it's the defensive you know it's the it's it's everything so many of us have even in slight forms in different areas of just i mean alan savory joked about trump i'm not leaving but really it's, there's a bit of trump in all of this I, <laughs> can, can i dare say i'll own it totally, um, yeah yeah i'm no i'm not giving this up whatever it is it's that mm-hmm. and um so to relinquish that you have to know at some level you know even subconsciously probably not overtly that you're held yeah that you're held so so the the support networks then amongst regen farmers are some of them are amazing like the one with rcs australia terry mccosker's mob and, and david mclean's mob in yapoon in queensland you know what charlie massey calls the the greatest regenerative agriculture movement in australia it's come out of there in the last 30 years and they'll have a big celebration for it next year with zach bush there if yeah borders permitting and all that but yeah their their support their peer support learning programs and i mean that's the exclamation mark on it when you can get it working like that where you come together with trust and mutual learning where you stay connected through a journey yeah and but that could apply and is being applied across the board uh that so that's powerful i think that's probably the nub of so so if it's okay just to follow on with the same line of inquiry just a little bit one more iteration the so i'm i just i'm thinking about the the towns for instance i had a three-hour chat one day with the ceo of lake grace um which is you know full of salt lakes in the area it's a huge huge area and we were talking about all different aspects of the ecology and economy that as the ceo she's ultimately responsible for you know looking after including the community and and adam and i have also got a friend from melbourne who um, comes over to perth and uh, does a lot of work with the cooperatives in western australia and that includes quite a few ag- agricultural cooperatives which are some of the oldest you know most stable yeah. organizations of all and i'm just wondering like so as farmers move from you know start buying so much fertilizer that's going to have a disruptive effect on the local economy because they're often coming into town a lot of the people that they work networking with are the people that they're buying off and that's their trust networks yep and so how do you look um you know is is there opportunities for the for the cooperatives to find new new opportunities for them to be able to you know um support the farmers but in ways that are more constructive and then how can the local government potentially look at um how they might be able to support regenerative agriculture if it's going to have a mental health benefit for the community you know because through network and connection i'm just i'm kind of interested by in that kind of stuff because it can help move things faster oh yeah yeah, no, totally. I, and, you know, I feel like you're at my edge too, Andrew, really, in, in asking those questions. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend to know the answer to that question, but I, but I think you're onto, onto it, that there's huge potential in that, you know? Um, and as much because it's everything that work well, obviously everything works and doesn't work in various ways. I don't want to paint total rose-coloured glasses over, over that co-op history, but clearly it worked in many ways. And, and, you know, I talked about the African-American history. 
Collective Courage, was it, that I said the book was called? Amazing stories of the only ways that economies could be done at the time. And, and they worked in terms of taking care of each other and having communities be connected and stay on country. Like, because now it's just, you know, communities off country. So the ones that are left are, are super alone. And, uh, and as for governments, I mean, there isn't a question I noticed in the chat there from Angela, which is a really good question. So I might tie it in here as well. Is there a role for state governments to incentivize regen farming? No use ask, asking the feds. Well, funnily enough, at federal level, programs are coming out that are semi-useful. Again, they're not holistic, but they're parts of what you could imagine working, biodiversity credits, for example. So not just carbon, because we're not just talking about carbon. The biodiversity is probably a more reliable sort of benchmark if you're gonna have one. But again, you don't want one, you want the holistic picture. But it's to say that even with that ideologically driven government, while not holistic, and we need that, like we still need to move to that, it's not monolithic. And this was true of even the Burmese situation, you know, with the military government in Burma, I used to study that when I was doing international development stuff. And, and the emphasis was the same there as it is everywhere. It can look monolithic. That's part of what they're trying to portray, but it's, it never is. There's people in there trying to pull stuff off. There's programs that slip through cracks. There's programs that they don't even realize are sort of on the money for, for our thinking that they're there. So I don't know, it's, it's go all levels really. Um, but, but yes, connected to place. And that is the thing. That's where it can't be federal alone. And that's where, you know, you're talking local government, Andrew, that, that's, that's vital to the extent local governments are looking for a bit more, um, I don't know, ability to actually respond to what's happening in their areas. That's there too. Yeah, I think, I think your question's a live one for them as much as the people on country. And, and I think some of the stuff we talked about, the paradigm holding dynamics, um, and I see there's a couple other comments on that there um, briefly. Yeah, I mean that's it. I think I think in general terms we get the we get the picture of what can circumvent those and move that it is all around relationship, seeing through processes, developing trust, um, trying stuff, but nothing too big, and being able to change when stuff doesn't go the way you, you know, all that. Let, let on the bigger answer. Let's keep keep at it and share notes. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anthony. We have to break here. In an hour that was super interesting we could go on as always for another hour but it's a starter a conversation started this one so we'll put this up online so you can spread it uh, probably yeah hopefully uh, now in december we get all of them up and in two weeks as i mentioned in the beginning we have michelle maloney uh, who's the whatever she's convener of the whole nina national network to wrap up the year and talk about the new civil civic strategy for, for Nina that were that worked on for this year. So zoom in then uh, and um, yeah, see you then. And thanks heaps, Anthony and all of you for joining.